Edward Leland Cowper was born in 1890 in Great Falls, Montana, and by 1910, at the age of 20, he was studying art at the California School of Design. He was also working in a San Francisco bookshop to pay for his studies, and it was there that he made the acquaintance of a university professor named Joseph McKnight. He became aware of Cowper's college work and admired it so much he generously sponsored him to travel to Paris for more study. And in gratitude for this benevolence, Cowper added the name McKnight to his and kept it for the rest of his life. So in 1913 he left for Paris, but on his way he stopped off in Chicago to see an exhibition of paintings by European artists, including Cézanne, Picasso and Matisse. These paintings and the posters of Ludwig Holwein, whose work he discovered on another stop in Munich, left an obvious and enduring impression on McKnight Kaufer. While studying at the Academy Moderne in 1914, he married American pianist Grace Ehrlich, but when France went to war with Germany later that year, they left for the relative safety of London. Not long after his arrival, he was fortunate enough to be introduced to Frank Pick, the publicity manager for London Transport, who had acquired a reputation as a keen moderniser of the company's graphics, and particularly their posters. McKnight Kaufer's work was a good fit with this ethos, and he was soon producing transport posters on a regular basis. These early lithographic posters were scenic in nature and depicted various rural locations which could be reached from the capital by the various means of transportation offered by the company. All of them were undeniably modernist in their execution, with striking combinations of non-representational, generally flat colour. But they were somewhat graphically undecided and gave only a hint of the more radically styled imagery he would go on to create. His work for Frank Pick drew a lot of favourable attention from others and he started to take commissions for similar posters for other clients. And not much later he also undertook the design of a series of stylish labels for a range sold by a fabric wholesaler. But it was his transport posters which enjoyed the highest public profile and they became increasingly ubiquitous on the walls of the underground stations and other locations around the capital. Although he had originally intended London to be a stopping off point on his return to the USA, by the time the war had ended in 1918, he decided to make London his base of operation for the foreseeable future. By 1920, the many posters he was now creating were now considerably more extreme in their abstraction and futurist geometric styling. And alongside his ongoing association with London Transport, in the early 1920s, he produced a series of particularly attractive and hard-to-ignore posters for the Eastman Dry Cleaning Company, which demonstrated the graphic assurance he had by now acquired. Although all his designs were unequivocally modernist and far from representational, McKnight Kaufer continued to demonstrate his creatively restless nature by varying his approach from poster to poster. Some were harsh angular constructions, but there were also some more bucolic scenes which, although driven by geometry, still revealed a fondness for the application of paint, similar to that of Cezanne. But however they were styled, they were invariably dynamic, uncluttered and aesthetically balanced with the inclusion of the tasteful, equally modernist letter forms. In 1925 he created illustrations mimicking wood engraving for the book The Anatomy of Melancholy, written by Robert Burton sometime around 1600. But otherwise it was posters which occupied his time, and as well as his work for British clients, he also created a series of posters for a printing company in Philadelphia in the following year. And in 1926 he returned to book work with an edition of Benito Serino, written by Herman Melville, originally published in 1885. And his work for this story revealed another aspect of his stylistic approach, with a collection of fragmented cross-hatched line drawings enhanced with selected areas of limited colour. A year later he designed the cover and page illustrations for a collection of poems by T.S. Eliot, which went even further into the realms of abstraction with illustrations which indicated that in this instance at least, McKnight Kaufer didn't much care whether they were understood or not. 
This was also reflected in his cover for the same year as the modern art movement by R.H. Walensky, and a host of poster designs, magazine and book covers also produced in the later years of the decade, which frequently blurred the accepted lines of what was illustration and what was graphic design. Among these particularly angular creations was his first poster for Shell Oil, who would become one of his most valuable clients. But in 1929 he produced a series of far more human illustrations for Elsie and the Child, a novel by Arnold Bennett. This was a limited edition of just 750 copies, and all of them were hand-coloured by the Pochoir stencil method with remarkable textured effects. 1930 saw the publication of two more books, each of which revealed distinctively different stylistic approaches. The World in 2030 by the Earl of Birkenhead was a speculation about what the future a century from publication might be like, and McKnight's blockishly styled monochromes, which was one of his earliest ventures into the use of the mechanical airbrush, made for a very plausible, predictive and frequently dystopian collection even if that wasn't always the intention of the text. And the second of that year was a translation of Don Quixote, another limited edition with grainy monochromes overprinted with completely non-representational pochoir areas. In 1931 he illustrated another book with what looks again very much like pochoir colouring, although I have no proof of it. This was a contemporary novel by American writer Carl Van Vechten about the lives of a group of black people living in Harlem. The strictures of YouTube censorship and prevailing current attitudes prevent me from telling you the actual title, but you can always look it up using the author's name. And although he continued to create book cover designs, this would be his last actual illustrated book for quite a few years to come. Many of the posters he produced at this time were very much celebrations or at least acknowledgements of the machine age and our increasing reliance on technology. And significantly in 1932, he resumed his association with Shell and created more compelling and actually quite diversely styled posters for the company throughout the decade. As had by now become his general practice, he roam freely between brutalist geometric solutions, redolence of the Italian futurist movement, and a more lyrical, even organic, if still far from representational approach. And it seems that his relationship with the company was such that he was encouraged to exploit diversity in his advertising work for them. More transport posters also appeared at this time which indicated his level of fascination for the use of the airbrush and its ability to create tonal transitions. Whether this came about following his undoubted familiarity with the posters of A.M. Cassandra gained on his frequent trips to Paris isn't recorded. But there were other quite noticeable similarities in his juxtaposition of elements in any given composition and it seems perfectly likely. It was during one of his visits to Paris in 1932 that he met Marion Dawn, an American interior designer, and they started an affair which quickly led to him leaving his first wife and daughter. And around this time he also began to involve himself in creating abstract designs for textiles for wealthy style conscious clients. From the mid-1930s onwards, his restless creative nature led him to experiment with the incorporation of photo montage into quite a few of his poster designs, sometimes to the exclusion of any illustrated elements whatsoever. But this was only ever an occasional indulgence on his part, and most of what he produced, including yet more imagery for Shell, was created only with paint or drawn elements, even if on occasion completely abstract. All this activity took McKnight Calfer very successfully up to the outbreak of World War II in 1939, and rather than risk being bombed by German aircraft, he left with Marion Dawn for New York. Despite the immense success he had enjoyed in Britain, he initially found the going considerably tougher in New York, where he was just one of a large number who had got out of Europe, who were also using modernist techniques and styles but he did create some propaganda material when the USA joined the Allies following Pearl Harbor, and also found favour as a designer of book covers. 
and in 1944 he returned to book illustration for a new edition of W. H. Hudson's 1904 book Green Mansions. With a series of colour images which were highly atmospheric and impressionistically rendered in a medium I couldn't pinpoint with any certainty, although they could be gouache. More book covers followed in the middle of the decade and by 1947 he was also producing transport posters for the New York subway, including an apparently isolated return to photo montage. But most significantly he also took his first commission for American Airlines in that year, and this quickly became another professional association as crucial to his ongoing success as his earlier work for Shell. The company commissioned him to create a large number of posters advertising the delights of the locations they flew to, some of which were domestic and some of which were international. By this point the USA had become considerably more amenable to more non-representational styles and once more McKnight Kaufer found himself in the right place at the right time. Much of his more angular futurist styling had by now largely evaporated and the visual evidence indicates that it was the styling of the posters of A.M. Cassandra which was a far more abiding influence. He finally married Marion Dawn in 1950 and as the new decade began it looked like he was set for quite a few more years of professional success with more book covers and posters for American Airlines. But unfortunately fate had other plans and in 1954 he died in New York at the age of only 64. Despite his early exit, Edward McKnight Calfer had managed a four decade long career, during which time he had been a significant presence in the move away from traditional representation and painted realism. He was among those who had pioneered a modernist approach which would eventually be labelled Art Deco, and by the end of his career what had begun as a radical departure from the expected norms of illustration had become widespread practice on both sides of the Atlantic. And his legacy is still clear to see in the work of many contemporary illustrators and graphic designers, quite a few of whom I suspect don't even know his name. <laughs>